I would like to share with you some pieces of thought, and I will do it in English. And I place all of these four different things in, uh, under four different items. The first one is about same place, different time. <clears throat> I think Vienna today is not the same Vienna as in 92. Uh, because at that time, as uh, Mary reminds us, Vienna was a door between East and West. And today, Vienna is not anymore on the international politics map. But at that time also, I would like to remind you that European Union has only 12 members and nine official languages. And it's only after the signature of the Treaty of Maastricht that enlargement started. I would not like to remind you the change in technology and also the effect of globalization. Just one question. In 92s, nobody could anticipate the changes as we are facing them today. How can we anticipate the next 20 years? And I think one of the missions of the university is to anticipate the future. And unfortunately, universities are not able to do that anymore. During this time, in the 90s, I think there was a lot of people at that time bet on Vine d'Albelme. Scopo's theory was starting to merge, and the cultural turn took over our community. I would like to refer to Gideon Sturry's article about the 20 years of, or 20 years of uh, Target, because I think he gave a very nice overview of the changes between 89 and 2009. By the way, at that time, Target one, was one of the 13 journals which existed at that time. Nowadays, we have more than 120 journals in translation studies. And more than 50 has been created in the last 10 years. Another thing which is also very important is the diversity of practice. And nowadays, I wonder how a scholar can take into account all kinds of practice in translation. Not only localization, not only trans-editing, trans-creation, versionization, but also the fact that today we are facing crowdsourcing translation. Does it mean that everything has changed? very deeply or not, I wonder. I think uh, there, are, there is a denial very strongly still today uh, in, in our job and in our profession, and I think translation study has to cope with them. Uh, denial of translation as a need, and of course we could discuss what is a need in that respect, but because we don't know the needs, it's very difficult to, uh, to anticipate or foresee the, the need of the market and how many graduates we should train. The denial of translation as an activity, I mean a full-time activity because it's not protected. Denial of uh, translation as a profession, and I think most of the translators are still what we could call subaltern workers. And then denial of translation studies as a discipline, because still today in many university translation studies is between languages and literature. And in another way, I think it's reflecting the fact that university have difficulties or very uneasy to cope with interdisciplinarity, intercultural communication, and language diversity. Anyway, in 20 years, we have known, as you know, a lot of different terms in translation but also very fashionable trends. And I think this is very something appealing for me. For instance, for a long time, and still today in certain countries, domination of VDW and May models, and especially in Quebec, for instance. And then you have the uh, interpretative theory in France, which was dominating in the years 1890. And then Scopo's theory came in, which is hardly referred to today. And then you have a dissemination of a think-aloud protocol, and then 
after some time, everybody was referring to the agenda by Venuti, and after some time, everybody was referring to Bourdieu, and so on and so on. And today, everybody is referring to cognitive turn. I think we should think a little bit more about fashionable. And there is not only fashionable trends, but our discipline is also full of taboos. And I would like to say, to give some examples. Taboos, because we have a lot of implicit ideology under some certain theory. And for instance, uh, ideology of the Scopos theory, when referring to efficiency in communication, this morning, the elect talk about productivity and uh, the notion, notion, the concept of agency with the calcul of risk and uh, in localization with the concept of workflow and management. I think all these concepts should be questioned in a little bit more systematic way. Another taboo, which is very important, and we quote, I mean, we refer to that this morning about the statue of the working languages and especially the languages which are less used or less uh, diffused or distributed, and the migrant languages. And I would like to, to stress here problems met by official bilingual countries today. I think Canada, for instance, has very much difficulties to deal with a lot of translation problems and interpreting problems because they are not able to get out of their official bilingualism, French and English. And I see, for instance, also in Finland, we are still dealing with uh, the official bilingual Finnish and uh, Swedish, but for instance, in Turku, which is a very small city, more than 60 languages are spoken every day. And uh, we have difficulties to cope with that. And uh, another taboo is also the directionality. And I think it will be time to think an, again about the relationship between bilingualism and translation. I mean, the dogma in the 80s was very strong that if you are bilingual, you are not necessarily a good translator or interpreter, but a lot of research has been done in bilingualism, and I think it will be time to, to go back to this. And uh, uh, I don't think we should survive only by using dogma. Uh, another thing which is also, very inter I think, very important, uh, taboo, is to talk about money in our field. And the economical dimension of translation and interpreting is uh, far from being studied. Another thing which is also very important, self-translation by academic people. And I think this is a very strong taboo, and maybe this explains why universities are very reluctant to talk about language policy and diverse, uh, language diversity. Another thing which is also a kind of taboo, for me at least, is uh, why do we need to train interpreters by starting in consecutive before we get to the booth. And I think this is time now to uh, question that uh, taboo. And another one, I have maybe a lot of, uh, but I will finish with that, another one, about the role of the body and emotions in the act of translating. And I think this is very important. I would like to refer to Antoine Berman, who, who talk about compulsive desire of translating and I think, I was talking about denial of translation. Now we are living a time where we are going from denial of translation to desire of translating, especially thanks to technology. And I think the change is very important because it might change the representation and image of translation and translator. I have some time still? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, I have to go skip this. Maybe I will uh, go next. Institu institutionalization and interdisciplinarity. <clears throat> of course, I have no time to talk about the different constraints and challenges of uh, institutionalization of research. But again, uh, in the last two, three years, uh, some people have uh, taken a strong position about uh, translation studies, and I'm referring to Eurocentrism and things like that. Uh, I think, as uh, Anthony said it this morning, the variety of the membership in EST proved the opposite. Uh, we are not so uh, European-centric as we believe. And I think in a very paradoxal way, 
when everybody, more or less, have doubts about EU today, EST reinforces its position with European institutions. And I think this is a very interesting contradiction in a way. Another thing I think which is very important, uh, as you know, we have uh, borrowed a lot of uh, concepts from different uh, fields, and I think it may be also becoming time to question the borderline of our translation studies. And I mentioned here a few, few new disciplines. What is the relationship between translation studies and adaptation studies, intercultural studies, internet studies, knowledge management, transfer studies, web science, mediology? All these fields are concerned in tackling problem of communication and problem of differences. So I think translation studies will, I mean, will need to work with its different disciplines. Can we foresee a translation turn in other disciplines? Maybe so. Maybe we should acknowledge the orish power of translation, but again, we have a lot of work to disseminate the results of our research before the other disciplines will understand what we have been doing and believe in the heuristic power of translation. My last, my last item is about networking and organization of research. We have been several times today talking about geographical space and translation. And, uh, it's a fact that uh, some journals or some uh, association or even the names of articles or titles of articles refer to geography. I will see, give you some names. For instance, this, edited by the American Association of Translation Studies or l'Association Canadienne de Traductologie or an article called La Traductologie en Italie. I'm not convinced at all about this geographical aspect of things but I think we have a double move today in our field. On, certain, on the one hand, we have national association, regional association, and on the other hand, we have association more focusing on specialization. And in that case, they don't need the passport of the scholar. On one hand, some associations still be, believe that uh, the, the job of translation is unique and the cooperation, the cooperation of translators is very homogeneous. On the other hand, some associations believe that there is no more unique and homogeneous uh, job or association of translators. And we should not forget also the role played by websites or federating websites like Prose. Uh, on the, and the, over some like translator cafe, Aquarius, and so over, uh, which, which of course go beyond national borders. By the way, there is more than 100 associations of translators today in the 27 members of the EU. If we look at uh, organization in translation studies, then we, we realize also that some of them are based on national uh, borders, like you find instance, the Canadian Association, the Brazilian Association, Japan Association, and uh, some are not uh, enlarging the field, like for instance the uh, NIDA Institute, in, uh, and uh, then the YATIS or SEPTET, or European Association of Machine Translation, and of course LAIC. I think again, there is a kind of contradiction, and maybe we should solve that kind of contradiction. I don't think we, you, we should think about a utopic uh, international association of translators or translation studies, but maybe we could organize in a network the different association, at least for doing lobbying to the public authorities and to get funding, for instance, for our research. Maybe also to fight against any kind of censorship in translation and maybe also to promote human rights, and especially for translators. I have also some other suggestions for EST, and I would like to give them at least three or four now. For instance, for each Congress, I think we should invite people from a different part of the world, 
and also invite two or three speakers from that part of the world, which is a way to open up and keep opening up our concern. Also, one of the things which I think is very important, maybe EST could also organize a setup of network of referees in order to advise young scholars and when they are preparing a monograph. And also, maybe we could organize a thematic networks of scholars so far that we can reach a critical mass and get funding from instance from AU and some other uh, institution. By the way, I forgot to mention one thing. This morning we talked very much about AU, but in Europe there are also different institutions which are supporting quite a lot translation. I, I would like to remind you, for instance, in 95, the first international conference on audiovisual translation was possible because we got the support of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. And I think today they could support more if we were asking them. And the second institution was UNESCO. Uh, my last remark uh, and suggestion maybe to EST would be about the doctoral training. I am, I am wondering if we need the full complete programs in translation studies at that level or if we could and maybe we should share with other disciplines and specialize only part of the program in textual studies in translation. There is no university today which can offer all the subfields of translation studies uh, for doctoral studies. So in that way, I think we need to create a transnational network of universities. And my last remark linked to this doctoral training, it's about publication. I think PhD students do not know the editorial constraint and they don't know the effect of the international classification of uh, our journal today. And maybe EST could play a role in that. To conclude, over the last two decades, translation studies has undergone a very rapid growth as an academic field but I still, I think we need to do a lot of work for disseminating our research and to better organize young scholars if we want to survive in the next 20 years. Thank you very much. Thank you.